Hello and welcome to another video that covers some of the changes to the common body of knowledge that happened back in May of 2021. This video is intended for both newcomers and for those of you who've been studying the common body of knowledge since before May. The topic of audits and assessments changed quite a bit since 2018, so we're going to dig into the new topics as if we have no knowledge of the old topics. I have to admit that this particular topic took me a while to wrap my head around because it's not presented clearly by ISC squared, but I hope this video kind of helps to break down the topics into a more digestible format. So let's get into this. The best way to start dissecting this information is to think of audits or assessments like a card game. And the types of audits represent the different cards you'll get. Now the reason I do this is because, just like with most card games, you can be holding a number of different cards in your hand and it will mean different things. It doesn't matter what game you're playing, whether it's poker, blackjack, or go fish. Just think of whichever game you like. We can assign different attributes to the game we're playing or the audit we're conducting, and each attribute would be based on management's decision about what type of audit or assessment should happen. Notice here a few types of assessments that can be combined, which we'll dive into a little bit more. The first type of assessment is the external assessment. Think of this as your ace, and believe it or not, there's a reason I'm doing it this way. In poker, the ace is your most valuable card, and in assessments, external assessments could be your most powerful or your most valuable because they're conducted by a third party. They aren't necessarily the most valuable according to the common body of knowledge. I'm just saying it for the sake of you being able to retain the information. As a side note, the most valuable type of audit will always depend on your organization's need for the audit. And during this presentation, I'll probably use audit and assessment, those two terms interchangeably, so hopefully that doesn't cause too much confusion for you all. External assessments are done for the purpose of measuring a compliance standard. The next most valuable could be the internal assessment, so we'll call this one the king. Next would be the ethical penetration test, which we'll call the queen, followed by the control assessment, which we'll call the jack. So if you've read your chapter, you might be thinking, why is he only showing four here? The reason I've assigned these four to the top four cards in poker is because these four are the ones in the common body of knowledge that have official steps involved. So in my mind, these are the four types of audits and assessments that quote unquote count. All other quote unquote types of audits and assessments are going to be subtypes or styles, if you will, of conducting one of these four. That's just personal interpretation, and you'll see why in the next slide. So you do have to be a little bit flexible when you're looking at exam questions. This is an exact science. For example, ethical pen tests are almost always external, so you have to pay attention to what the question is saying and the context, and if the question asks you to choose an audit type, you really need to look at the scenario being presented in the question. With that said, the best way to organize this information, at least for now, until I come up with a better way, is through a chart that simplifies it a little bit. So at this point, I will get my pointer. So up top, we have the four official types of assessments or the four step-based assessments with their accompanying steps. So we have external, internal, ethical pen test, and control testing or control assessments. And then as you can see here, we have a row that shows each step. And down below, we have the different style of audit or assessments that can be combined with the type of step-based audit or assessment in the four categories. So let's dig into this a little bit and I will make this sheet available as a study tool and I'll put the link in the description of the video. So please feel free to make a copy for yourself and also copy this by hand onto your memorization sheet. External audits are done to measure compliance standards. So again, let's consider this to be our ACE card. We have the following steps for the external audits and assessment process. And as you can see, this is similar to the other steps presented here. There's some, a lot of similarities in these steps. Internal audits are done to meet risk expectations. And these are almost always informal. For the purpose of learning, we'll consider this to be our king card, since it doesn't have the same weight necessarily as the ace would. But again, it kind of depends on your organization's needs and wants. The steps are here, which we'll cover in more detail in the upcoming slides. Ethical pen tests are done to simulate an attacker or a threat actor. This would be our queen card. In practical terms, these are usually external and formal. The steps are shown here, and this is where it gets a lot different. And finally, we have control assessments, which are done to verify compliance with requirements and design specs. 
As the chart indicates here, the control assessments follow a combination or variety of steps just depending on corporate needs. We consider this our jack card. Down below here, we have various different types of assessments that would be secondary to the type you're doing above. The only reason I say this, as I said before, the common body of knowledge gives us specific steps with the four categories above, but not the types below. For example, an external audit here can also be a compliance audit below. So you'd have an ace of spades. As another example, you might have an ethical penetration test above here and either choose a blind or a double blind test below. So you'd have a queen of clubs or a queen of diamonds. Now let's look at the various steps involved. And since there are similarities, just pay attention to what happens at each of these rather than what type of assessment has those specific steps or how the assessments apply to the previous slide. Just, just kind of focus on what each step means because you might get a combination of these depending on the context of your question. So let's get into this. Chartering includes the following activities. Everything is done according to the direction of the auditor. So your management involvement should support and direct the activities within the organization, of course, at the direction of the auditor. Chartering is also where the depth and breadth of the assessment is decided. And with penetration testing, this is governed by what's called a rules of engagement. And that's an agreement that outlines specifically what can and can't be done, and it's legally enforceable. Chartering is where the schedule of work is decided, and also how and who the work will be done by. It's also where the reporting methods and processes are decided. It's also where a stakeholder management plan is created, and this is where you would identify experts who can talk during interviews and provide test accounts for the assessors. And lastly, this is the phase where the contract would be signed with any external entities involved. So the pre-planning step does only apply to external assessments, but there are a lot of different brands of external assessments. Pre-audit planning it includes creating audit checklist, it includes identifying the areas for review, what artifacts are needed, and what the audit schedule is. Now, it's worth noting that the common body of knowledge says that the audit schedule is also part of the chartering process. So you might find this in either step if you have a question on it. Execution and testing could be called either one. So make sure that you kind of lump the two together because they mean the same thing. This is where the auditor or the assessor examines artifacts. It's where they perform tests, conduct interviews, it's where they would do on-site work, like collecting samples and any remote testing as well. For internal audit, this is the testing phase, which includes conducting the vulnerability assessments. And keep in mind here that a penetration test of a specific application or system might also be part of the testing or execution phase of an audit. Reporting is where the auditor subjects the artifacts to analysis and review. The results are then compiled into a draft report which is shared with the auditee or you know the organization being audited and it includes the findings and recommendations sometimes the report can have mistakes that can be clarified and corrected prior to the completion of the audit the audit report should be consistent with the charter in the scope and breadth of findings the reporting phase for pen testing includes returning of materials such as credentials keys badges or devices the discovery phase of a penetration test should be consistent with the rules of engagement. The testers define the breadth of the environment, but not the breadth of the whole audit. So pay attention to wording here. The term breadth of an audit is different than the breadth of the environment. So an easier word to probably think of is scope. So the scope of your audit is going to be different than the scope of a system. So you have system boundaries or breadth of a system or breadth of an environment versus uh, the scope or the breadth of the entire audit. So you might, you might get a question that has similar wording for that to try and confuse you. Keep in mind that identifying the breadth of the environment is an administrative step or process that's done before the testing activities. In other words, it identifies what is to be tested, not what is to be audited. So in terms of carrying out the exploit or carrying out the, the specific uh, tool that you're going to use. So if the rules of engagement already defines the system and areas in scope, this particular part of discovery wouldn't be needed. Scanning is where the fingerprinting of the system would be done and also where the identifying and preparing of any exploits would happen. 
exploitation. This is, I believe, a pen testing step. This is where the exploit would be delivered and the tester documents the results of the compromise. So it's important that that rigorous adherence to the rules of engagement be followed. And the reason for this is that it might provide the opportunity for real damage to happen. So then when withdrawing from the compromised system, the pen tester or the auditor has to make sure that that particular compromise didn't increase the possibility that another compromise can happen or that further compromises can't happen. Basically, they have to reduce the possibility that a malicious actor can further exploit that system. So remediation is the internal process of how findings are fixed. This could involve change management or configuration management processes. And again, configuration management is where your baseline is concerned. So to illustrate why I've presented things this way as, you know, a, a deck of cards and a poker game or whatever kind of card game you're thinking of, but with your name of the card and then your suit is, I think we need to create a question using this material in order to kind of clearly illustrate this. So now if you're new to this channel and our website, you might be thinking that this question is too challenging or absurd, but I can promise you that the questions you encounter on the exam are in line with this style that I'm about to show you if not 10 times more difficult. So here we go, and I recommend that you pause this video and try to come up with the answer on your own without looking at any of the charts or any of the previous slides. Just kind of take a, take a minute to pause the video, read this question, read the available options, and see if you can come up with an answer on your own, okay? And then we'll get into a discussion about what why the answer that's correct is the correct answer. So go ahead and pause it, and I'll give you a few seconds here. Okay, so hopefully you paused the video and tried to figure this out. Let's look at the question in detail. And the best way to do this is to read the question over a few times. I do have a few videos that kind of go over how you should analyze a CISSP question. ISC Squared recommends that you actually read the options first down here and then read the question. For some of you that might work, but I think the key here is to use a process of elimination. You definitely have to read through everything a couple of times because the questions can be really confusing. So when you read this about, I don't know, second or third time, hopefully some things start to stick out. We have the words internal group up here. So we know this is some type of internal assessment. We also have the words attack simulation. And so we know that it's probably some type of penetration test. Hopefully you were able to glean that from the question and ultimately rule out two of these options. So if we know it's a penetration test of some kind, we know it's gonna be one of these two here. So we can rule out A, and D. And about this zero touch architecture mentioned here. Sometimes you'll see technologies or methods that you're not aware of in the questions. Things will pop up and you won't even understand. They'll kind of make you pause or make you stop. It might even frustrate you a little bit. In this case, it's actually meant to be a distractor to the overall question. So in other words, you can ignore this zero touch environment and just be able to solve the question without knowing what that is exactly. And that's not always the case. I mean, sometimes you do need to know, and sometimes it's pertinent to the question. But as you read them during the exam, be sure to ignore words that you don't recognize and then read through the whole thing to try and solve the question anyway. So now we have this oddly worded phrase without notifying the assessor about any system details. So pay attention to the wording here because it's basically saying that no notice was given. And so you might be thinking no notice penetration test or penetration assessment, but the key is to who or to whom and about what. So a no notice audit is where the auditee is not giving any notice. So the person being audited is not given any notice. And a blind test is where the auditor or tester isn't given details about the system. So in the end, our correct answer is the ethical blind penetration assessment. And notice the standard terminology would be penetration test, but they use the word assessment here just to be extra confusing and to throw you off a little bit more. So take a look at this table again and notice how certain elements of the table below and even above can be applied to each other. This is why I said in the beginning that you should be a bit flexible when learning some of this material, but especially this audit and assessment stuff, because it's not perfect science. And in the exam, you'll most likely get questions that mix and mash up the wording in a way that will be super confusing and based only on the context of the question itself. Sadly, this is not something that any of the books are teaching you, nor are any of the practice questions going to be like this. 
Most of the ones you'll encounter out there are run-of-the-mill rewordings of official definitions, and to me, that's not helpful at all. It didn't help my group. It didn't help any of us prepare for the exam. This is why we created our site and why we're doing these videos. Our goal is to really bridge the gap between the big-time content creators and the actual exam and the students. So we hope this video was helpful. Please take a minute to visit our site and support our efforts. We're confident that our practice questions will be useful in your preparation efforts. Thanks for watching and have a great day.